Hello and welcome back to Crash Course. Today we're going to be continuing to look at the neurosensory system. Essentially the neurosensory system is made up of an absolute wide variety of aspects and what we're really going to be focusing on today are the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. What this will involve is us comparing the different cells that exist in each of the two systems as well as having a look at the functional divisions i.e. the brain and the spinal cord for the central nervous system and the autonomic and the somatic divisions of the peripheral nervous system. So let's start by having a look at the central nervous system, which as we know is divided up into the brain and spinal cord. In terms of the cells of the central nervous system, we have ependymal cells. So these are the cells that line the ventricles of the brain and the central canal in the spinal cord. They assist in producing, circulating and monitoring of the CSF. Oligodendrocytes, so these myelinate the central nervous system axons and they're the equivalent of swan cells, which exist in the peripheral nervous system, so they ex have exactly the same function, i.e. they myelinate axons, but they work in the central nervous system, and they also provide structural framework. Astrocytes are cells which maintain the blood-brain barrier, which we'll learn a little bit about later on, and they provide structural support as well. In addition to this, they regulate ion, nutrient and dissolved gas concentrations, as well as absorbing and recycling neurotransmitters. They form scar tissue after injury as well. Lastly, we have microglia, and these remove cell debris, waste, and pathogens by phagocytosis. So, in terms of the central nervous system, of course, the first functional part is the brain. And this can be split up, as we've early discussed in videos, into different lobes. So, we have the frontal lobe, the temporal lobe, the parietal, and the occipital. Of course, down here we have the brain stem and the cerebellum as well. In terms of functionality, the frontal lobe is all about movement of the body control of our personality, concentration and planning, problem solving, meaning of words, emotional reactions, speech and smell. The parietal lobe is all to do with touch and pressure, sensation, taste, body awareness and visual spatial processing. The occipital lobe is simply our visual cortex predominantly and the temporal lobe is all to do with hearing, recognising people, emotions, long-term memory and visual analysis. Of course, the cerebellum at the back, not essentially functionally part of the brain, more our little brain sat at the back, and it, this is responsible for fine motor control, balance and coordination, and will be discussed in the last video of this series. So, to explore a few of these areas in a little bit more detail, first of all we have Broca's area, which is an area for production of speech. So, it's located in the frontal lobe of the left hemisphere in the majority of people. There is a correlation between what hand, uh, whether you're right-handed or left-handed, and where the... Um, Broca's area is located, but for the majority of people it's on the left hand side. And it's responsible for precise control of the mouth and laryngeal muscles, which means if it's damaged, the patient's still fully able to understand language, but isn't able to form words properly, and therefore their speech may be slow or slurred. This can be really frustrating for patients, especially because they're just as intelligent as they were before, and obviously as doctors it's important to appreciate that, um, in respect that they're just as clever as before, they're just having difficulty getting those words out due to a damage of the Broca's area. Wernicke's area, on the other hand, is all to do with understanding speech. This is located in the left temporal lobe, and it's responsible for understanding of written and spoken language. So if this is damaged, a patient may not be aware of their own or other people's speech, so usually they may be able to um, speak perfectly fine, but the words that they produce are not relevant to, say, a question that they've been asked because they haven't been able to comprehend what's been said or written to them. So they may put words together, therefore, that don't make sense. Also looking at the brain, we have the motor association cortex, and this essentially, the premotor cortex, occupies Brodmann area number six, and it's located immediately anterior to the primary motor cortex. So you've got the primary motor cortex here, just sat uh, in front of the central gyrus in the pre-central gyrus, and then you have this pre-motor cortex just in front. Essentially, it plays a role in planning and anticipating specific motor acts, and therefore is our mental rehearsal of movements as such before performing this complex function which the motor cortex will uh, instruct to carry out. So the actual primary motor cortex, this is our highest level of motor function where our information comes from, and the function is of the action of precise, skillful, and intentional or voluntary movements. So the regions of the motor cortex mirror that of the body. So this is all to do with the homunculus, which we'll explore in a few moments' time. Next, of course, we must have sensory areas. So we've got a somatic sensory association area, and then we have a primary sensory cortex as well, which is located just behind the central gyrus in the post-central gyrus. So the association area, first of all, this lies immediately posterior to the primary somatosensory cortex. 
It integrates different sensory inputs, i.e. the touch and pressure, which is coming up through the spinal cord. It integrates these uh, this information. And it draws upon stored memories of past sensory experiences as well. With regards to the actual primary sensory sensory cortex, this is receiving information about the body's sensation. And this area of the cortex again relates to the sensitivity of the body part. And this is to do with the homunculus, which we'll explore later on. Furthermore, you've got the visual cortex in the occipital lobe. And essentially, this is highly specialized for processing information about static and moving objects. It's excellent at pattern recognition. It's further divided into specialist regions within the occipital lobe. This is a um, schematic drawing showing the pathway down the optic nerve, the optic chiasm, the optic tract, to the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus, and then back to the visual cortex. So this is a pathway which was explored in the previous video. So this homunculus that we've talked about, this is essentially what it looks like, and you have one of these for motor and sensory aspects. So a homunculus is a distorted representation of the human body, and it's based on a neurological map of sorts of the areas and proportions of the human brain detected uh, dedicated sorry, to processing motor or sensory functions. So what's really important is, for example, the um, mouth and tongue and face has a really high uh, surface area, essentially, on this motor cortex. In other words, we have a lot of motor output to the face. Likewise, this can be seen on a sensory aspect as well, in terms of where we can where we have greater levels of sensation input um, on the homunculus. So within the cortex, different areas control different parts of the body. And the homunculus allows us to say uh, how much of the cortex relates to each body part. So in other words, how much control do we have over each area? Next, another aspect to be aware of is the neocortex. And the easiest way to explore this is to compare it to the cerebellar cortex. However, in the neocortex, we have six layers, and each of these essentially has a different functional layer or packed with different types of cells. I'm going to explore this a little bit more in the last video when we look at the cerebellar cortex, as it's a really good way to compare them. Having said this, layer four, particularly the internal granulaire, this is from the thalamus, so this is densely packed with stellate cells. And layer five is from and to the brainstem, and this is made up particularly of large pyramidal cells, or a few stellate cells accompanying those, and there are the great pyramidal cells of Betts in this region as well. In terms of the brain, of course, anything that can go wrong, a lot of them begin with A, so aphasia, agnosia, alexia, agraphia, ataxia, and apraxia. Um, all the A's essentially, so impairment of the language um, is aphasia, inability to interpret uh, sensations and hence the ability to recognize things is agnosia, alexia is the disorder of reading, agraphia is the disorder of writing, ataxia is the lack of voluntary coordination of muscle movements, and apraxia is the difficulty with motor planning and performance. Moving down towards the brainstem, of course, different regions of the brainstem also have important functions, so the midbrain does have roles in vision, hearing, eye movement, and body movement. The pons is involved in motor control and sensory analysis, and the medulla oblongata is responsible for vital body functions, such as heart rate and respiratory rate. Don't forget, the pons also has a role to play in the respiratory system as well, and the control of the respiratory rate and the ways in which we breathe. In terms of the central nervous system as well, be aware of the diencephalon, so we made up of the hypothalamus, in other words, our monitor, uh, monitor of homeostasis in the body, and the thalamus, of course, which is that relay station in the brain, which allows impulses to be um, distributed out towards the cortex to the different regions of the cerebral cortex. The limbic system is another important aspect to be aware of. So this is a set of brain structures on both sides of the thalamus, which is inferior to the cerebrum. It's made up functionally of the hippocampus, the amygdala, the fornix, the cingulate gyrus, the anterior thalamic nuclei, the olfactory bulbs of the mammillary body, some of those parts which are more important than others in terms of what you need to know about. And the limbic system essentially is involved in our motivation, our memory, our learning and emotion. So it is closely linked to the nucleus accumbens, which plays a role in sexual arousal and the high derived um, from recreational drugs. So in terms of limbic system, this is a, a probably the best photo you'll find of the limbic system really, and this is a hippocampus. This allows us to lay down new memories, so removing the hippocampus completely will result in no new memories being laid down, so we only unilaterally remove the hippocampus if necessary. Next we have the amygdala, so this is located deep within the medial temporal lobe, and it receives highly processed information. It's responsible for emotional memory, memory as well and it produces instinctive emotional output. Next, we have the hypothalamus, of course. This arguably is not functionally part of the limbic system, although some people do class it as the limbic system. 
And in terms of memory, we have several different types of memory. So first of all, we have working memory, which is located within the prefrontal cortex. And this is our short term memory. In other words, it lasts a few seconds. We then have long term memory. And this essentially is our explicit memory. And this can be declarative, which is either episodic or semantic. If it's not explicit, it's implicit. And this is either memory which remembers skills, i.e. the cerebellum, or conditioned reflexes, i.e. the cerebellum again, or emotion, i.e. the amygdala. Um, we mentioned these two words here, episodic and semantic. Episodic are things we know just day to day. So, for example, how was your first day at work? And semantic is things we just know. So, for example, if someone said to you, what is a city? What is a banana? You would just know what it is. And, of course, another important aspect of the central nervous system is how conscious is your patient. So, the consciousness is a state of being aware and responsive to one's surroundings. And clinically, we mark this using the GCS for Glasgow coma scale um, to assess the conscious state of an individual. Next we have the blood-brain barrier which I did say I would go back to and essentially this is a barrier made up of astrocyte foot processors with tight junctions in between. The overall function is to try to maintain a stable environment for the brain because it is a sensitive organ. Usually it's very effective against lots of different molecules but particularly molecules that it is unable to act against are alcohol, nicotine, anesthesia and fat soluble molecules. Of course, anesthesia is really important, but it doesn't act against that in terms of general anesthetic for um, operations. And alcohol, of course, can still do damage to the brain, which is why it doesn't work there. In terms of the spinal cord, it can, of course, be divided into those regions that we discussed earlier, the cervical, thoracic, lumbar and sacral regions. And it terminates around L2 into a bundle of nerves known as the corda equina. It carries those motor and sensory pathways, which we're going to discuss later on. And if you think about a cross-section of the spinal cord, the grey matter is those are those unmyelinated cell bodies and dendrites, and the white matter are our myelinated axons, and it's divided into columns and tracts. The spinal cord is protected by meninges, the meninges which also exist um, in the brain, and you've got the dura matter, the arachnoid matter, and the pia matter. Within those, you've got the CSF, the cerebrospinal fluid present, um, obviously in the brain ventricles, but also in the central canal of the spinal cord, and this allows buoyancy and protection, as well as maintaining that chemical stability that the CSF is known to do. Next, we have the peripheral nervous system, and it's a little bit more complicated, but simple at the same time. So in terms of the peripheral nervous system, of course, we've got sensory and motor aspects. The motor aspects can be divided into somatic and autonomic, and the autonomic can be further subdivided into sympathetic and parasympathetic. In terms of the cells of the peripheral nervous system, you've got satellite cells, and these surround the neuron cell bodies, and they regulate things like oxygen and CO2 and nutrients. You've got swan cells, which do the same job as oligodendrocytes in the central nervous system. They myelinate the axons within the peripheral nervous system, and they also participate in repair processes after injury. Nerves can, of course, be different types, and they can be unipolar, pseudopolar, bipolar, or multipolar. So this up here is an example of a unipolar neuron, pseudopolar here, bipolar, and multipolar here. So in terms of the different nerves, first of all, we have a unipolar. These don't exist in humans. They only exist in intervertebrates and therefore not in humans. So humans do have, however, pseudo-unipolar neurons. So pseudo means fake or false, so false one-way neurons. In a pseudo-unipolar neuron, the axonal process leaves the cell body and splits into two axonal branches with one extending to each side, and they're exclusively sensory. Bipolar neurons have two processes from the cell body, one axon, one dendrite, and they can be found in the olfactory epithelium and the retina. They aren't very common in humans, and multipolar neurons um, are the majority of neurons in our body, and they have one axon, several dendrites, and they can be motor or sensory. Some of the important nerves to remember, I'd say, are the sciatic, the femoral, the saphenous, pudendal, the axillary and the vagus, and the common perineal as well. This is because they do have clinical relevance, but also because they're quite big nerves, um, and they're quite easy to test your knowledge on. In terms of the two types of nervous system, we know we've got a sympathetic nervous system, which comes from the thoracolumbar regions, and essentially it's all to do with fight and flight response. These have short preganglionic fibres and long postganglionic fibres. The parasympathetic nervous system is rest and digest, and this comes from the craniosacral region. In controversy, um, they have long preganglionic fibres and short postganglionic fibres. Lastly, to finish with for this video, we have the brachial plexus, so we start off with these aspects going from C5, C6, C7, C8 to T1. Um, this is just to give you an idea as to what it looks like in a simple diagram, like that. But this is what it truly looks like, and this is when it's applied. Um, the brachial plexus is really important for a variety of clinical reasons, and essentially it extends from the levels of the spinal cord through the cervico-axillary canal in the neck, over the first rib and into the armpit. So that's everything for this video. I do hope you found it useful. If you do have any feedback, please do let me know. And thank you for watching.